I want to welcome this morning once again uh, Pastor Ivan Reschino. He preached for us on Good Friday. He's going to be preaching for us this morning. Uh, quickly to introduce Pastor Ivan, He's, uh, he was a professional marine engineer and a naval architect. Uh, back in 1982, he gave his life to Jesus. In 1987, he was called into the ministry in Mumbai. Uh, okay, well, you all sat down already, okay? <laughs> Sit down. I was busy reading, you all sat down. Okay, please sit down, it's all right. Uh, let me introduce Pastor Ivan. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it was 1987, he was called into ministry and he started working in Mumbai. He left his job and he started serving the people on the streets of M Mumbai for many years. He planted a church and the church he planted was ministering primarily to her hurting people or came from difficult backgrounds. Pastor Ivan has taught in many churches in India, Japan, UK, and uh, has ministered to several people. Uh, he served as a prayer coordinator in the city of Mumbai for many years, uh, and uh, his wife, Melanie, is also with us uh, this morning. She led worship uh, in Mumbai. Uh, they've retired from active ministry in Mumbai. They've moved to Bangalore a couple of years ago, I think five years ago. Uh, settled down in Mumbai, spending more time mentoring other pastors and leaders. And so we are delighted to have Pastor Ivan come and minister to us. Let's put our hands together, rise to our feet one more time. Welcome him this morning. And uh, open our hearts to receive God's word. Pastor Ivan, welcome you. Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for this time of worship, time of connecting with you, Lord, for your encouragement. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to minister to your people. Lord, you speak to our hearts, deposit your holy word inside our hearts, Lord, that we may bear fruit, fruit that will last for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Yep. So, today, uh, I'm looking at Romans 1.17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness, and that is by faith from first to last. Just as, is it, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Yes. So, that's the verse today. To live a life of faith from beginning to end. All right? So these are the points that I have taken up. Right? So there we are. Uh, life, uh, faith, what is it first? Faith brings pleasure to God. Faith comes first. Understanding follows. Faith brings about transformation. And there we have A, B, and C. Transformation begins and ends with resting with God. Transformation makes you an overcomer, and transformation makes you more than conquerors. And that's where we want to be. We want to be what? More than conquerors. Right? You want to be more than conquerors. So, so faith, number one, faith, what is it? Now, uh, some, some, uh, just about some months ago, actually, about maybe a year and a half, maybe two years ago, God spoke to me, and he just told me one, one word, sit. That's the reason why I got these chairs here. Sit, he said, just sit. So he said, sit. So I, I sat, you know, I sat. And I said, God, what is it? He said, just sit, he said, sit. So I sat, I looked at the sky, I said, what's it? I saw the birds, I saw the trees, there was a mango tree in front of me, I looked at that, and I couldn't make out what God was saying. So, I sort of stayed over there, sitting over there on that chair for something like 15 minutes. I got up, told my wife, I said, God said to me, sit. So he said, sit. Okay, I said, yeah, but I'm getting fed up. I didn't know what he was saying, but I knew he said something. And when God speaks to you, uh, it's a door that is going to be open for more and more understanding of what God wants to say 
what God wants to build you up, how he wants to build you up in your life. So whenever he speaks to you, don't let it drop. So I didn't let it drop. I mean, I was just, but I, I needed to have a key to this door. Why? He told me to sit. But just a few weeks later, Billy Graham died. And I liked this guy so much, so I went on the YouTube and listened to his old sermons. And there, in one of his sermons when he was a young man, you know how Billy, you know, preaches, you know, he says, what is faith? I, I'm going to, sorry. He says, what is faith? I'm trying to imitate him. <laughs> <laughs> what is faith? <clears throat> and then he says, he learned the definition by an older preacher. I mean, that's in the previous century. And he says, he said, faith is recline it. I said, I got it. I got it. That's what Doc told me. He says, sit, recline it, rest, rest. So I began to look into it, and I know that God spoke to me. And so this sermon is, is something which God really began to open up to me concerning faith. And, of course, I consulted other preachers. I looked onto the YouTube. I went into all sorts of things, looking into commentaries. But it was God that was speaking to me. So, let's start. What is faith? Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for an assurance about what we do not see. Number two, this is what the ancients were commended for. Three, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So let's see this thing. Let's look at these three things. First, verse one. Verse one is description of faith. Verse 2, honor associated with faith. Verse 3, to see and do all things through faith. Let's take verse 1, the description of faith. In essence, faith is being confident and assured about unseen hopes. The confidence, you know, in the KJV, it is substance. Faith is the substance. NIV, it is confidence. It actually means this. To stand under or to be supported. Faith is a foundation. To stand, to sit, to rest, it's a foundation. It's a foundation to sit, to, for, for this to support you. So, for a Christian... Faith is to a Christian what foundation is to a house. If there is no foundation, the house will crumble. It gives confidence to a person that he will stand, that house will stand. He will stand. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for. What we hope for, of course, is what God promises. And faith is the confidence. I've got to be careful about this. Sitting down here, to sit, is to rest. I am confident about this chair, absolutely confident. I have got no problems that this chair is going to crumble under my weight. You know, I'm confident. I rest secure. We'll go further on this. We'll go further on this. So whenever I pray, I'm resting. I start with resting because I'm confident of the blood of Jesus. I'm resting on the blood of Jesus. I'm totally confident. I got no doubts. I got no doubts I'm a child of God. I got no doubts that his DNA is inside me. I got no doubts about it. I know that. I start my prayer with resting. I start my prayer in faith. I don't have to wind myself up I say, praise you, Lord, praise you, Jesus, praise you, this thought is sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of. I don't, don't have to do the jitterbug, you understand? All I have to do is to rest. You know, I don't have to wind myself up. 
I just rest. I don't have to say, praise you, Jesus, 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 praise you Heavenly Father. I don't have to do that. I just have to rest that I am accepted by the blood of Jesus. I am accepted as a child of God. I can rest. In fact, in fact, there are two things in the Bible that God tells us to remember. In the Old Covenant, it's the Passover. He says, tell your children about it. Remember this, remember Remember and celebrate this. And in the new covenant, it is remembering the Holy Communion, the Lord's table. There are two things in the Bible which the Lord tells us to remember. He says, you know, I have accepted you in the old covenant by the, the blood of the Lamb. And in the new covenant, by the blood of my own son, which was the fulfillment of the old covenant. So, I'm going to bring this thing out. And uh, there we are. That's it. That's Jesus there. I'm sitting here. And I'm resting in this covenant. His blood, his body shed for me. I'm just resting in it. He accepts me because of this covenant. He just accepts me that way, as I am. I, I might have blown it last night. I might have blown it yesterday. But when I sit here before his covenant and I said, Lord, look, I'm sorry, I've blown it. He said, that, that's it. It's okay. I saw you before the foundation of the world. I knew you were going to blow it up. <laughs> uh, that's a fact. But I yet accepted you. I accepted you. So just rest, rest in my covenant. So I sit and rest in his covenant, and Jesus is over there. Ah, that's great. So faith is a confidence. Actually means to be supported by. But faith is also the assurance. You know, in verse uh, Hebrews 11, 3, now, faith is a confidence in what we hope for and assurance. So this word assurance is is deeply being assured inside your heart. It's deeply being assured inside your heart. So now we combine these definitions and we say that faith is God's way of giving us confidence and assurance that what he has promised will be experienced by us. But when and how, we must leave it to God. We don't force God to tell us, now we want it. No. We trust God to do it in his time. But we are confident and deeply assured that we have it. You understand that? We are con There's no doubt about it. So when I sit before God in my prayer time, <clears throat> there's this covenant between us. He has made a covenant. And I'm deeply assured what he has promised. I'm confident I will, I will receive it. And you know, I received once, I mean just some time ago, I ordered an aluminum long ladder from Amazon. And it came in a huge box. I was wanting to bring the box here, but I thought it would be inconvenient. <laughs> but you can imagine, you can imagine, there's a huge box here, big tall one, you know these Amazon cardboard boxes, big one. But inside there is every blessing, that's Jesus. Because through him we receive what? Every blessing. 
every blessing, and that's amazing. Because when I sit here, I have faith that he gives me every blessing. I mean, blessing for my future, blessing for my family, blessing for my children, blessing, blessing for my work, blessing for my ministry, blessing for my finances, every blessing. Blessing for my sin problem, every blessing. Every blessing imagining. Uh, you can imagine, I receive it because of this covenant, because he is, gives me every blessing. Every blessing. All I have to do is to be confident and deeply assured that I'm going to get it. And every day, I rest in God. We're going to stop. We're going to go more. We're going to go more. See, that was verse 1. Verse 2 is, this is what the ancients were commended for. This is where God says, look, if you believe this, I am really happy with you. I commend you for it. Verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Huh. I mean, how did God make the whole universe? He just said, he just spoke and the universe was made. There was nothing there and he made it. There was nothing and he made it. Now, faith means to see and do all things through what God says. To see and do all things through faith, that is our life. Faith enables us to see what Others cannot see because it is invisible to them. For example, nobody believed about Noah's ark before it was made. I mean, they say, Noah, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? Uh, you're going crazy. But Noah could see something. As a man of faith, you see something. You see something which cannot be seen by others. So therefore, you will do something which others can't do. Right? But because you have seen something, and how do you see it? By spending time with God. He puts something in your heart, and you receive it and say, that's it. That's it. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to do it. When he nudges you, you say, I'm going to do it. I mean, every, every work as a Christian, is by faith. Everything is by faith. That's the life of faith, from first to last. Faith is not blind. You say, you know, you must have blind faith. No, 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 no. Faith can see what others can't see. Therefore, faith does what others can't do. All right? Faith does what others can't do. And of course, faith comes by hearing God. God speaks in Romans 10, 17. It's not here. But faith comes, of course, it's talking about salvation, faith, but it's a principle right through. Faith comes. It comes. It comes by hearing God. Huh? We're going to go further. Faith brings pleasure and amazement to God. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who honestly seek him. God created everything by faith. But Satan tempted our parents, our first parents, to doubt his word. Adam and Eve listened to Satan doubted God's word, and thus caused the fall of man. So you can see, whole of creation was destroyed because man did not have faith in God. In God's word, Satan made man doubt his God's word. 
So you know what brings pleasure to God? When you believe God's word. Duh. You believe it. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy that you believe it. Oh, great, great. You know, he is amazed when you believe his word. You know, in, uh, in Luke 7, 9, this, this Cornelius, no, the, the centurion, sorry, not Cornelius, centurion, his, his servant was sick. And he went to Jesus and he said, Lord, don't come. Just say it, just say it. It will be done. Jesus was amazed. He says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. I have not found it. See, when you exercise faith in God's work, he is amazed. He is so delighted. He tells all his angels, ha, oh, you warm God's heart when you believe his word. Next point. Faith comes first in the heart. Understanding follows. But it begins with surrender to him. Because you've got to surrender this. Because you've got to surrender what you can't, your mind, because you can't see the unseen. But you have hope and you have faith in the unseen when God speaks. But faith comes first. In Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand. Don't try to understand first. You only got nine inches by six inches. That's all you have. Plus minus a few centimeters here and there. That's all you have. You can't understand all that. But you got it by faith. By faith. Faith comes first. Understanding follows. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 to 16. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains where the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ it is taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. One would imagine the veil first must be taken away, then you can see. No, he says, when you first turn to the Lord, then the veil is taken away. Then the veil is taken away. But first, faith. When you turn to the Lord, faith. Then the veil is taken away. But when the veil is taken away, you see the glory of God. You see the glory of God. See, the, the old covenant is the law. The law means you've got to do it. You've got to obey it. It is human effort. But the new covenant is by grace. You have faith in God's grace. We will look at it further. Then the veil is taken away. Because when the veil is taken away, this transformation begins. You're transformed. Right? In 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So that's verse 17 says, the Holy Spirit gives us liberty from condemnation, freedom from condemnation because of the blood of Jesus. When you turn to the Lord, when you turn to the Lord, you have freedom. You're, you're not under the law. Rather, you have the Spirit of sonship, which says tenderly, Abba, Father. You have that relationship with him. 
In verse 18, it says, the veil is removed so we can now contemplate the Lord's glory. The Lord's glory, the Father heart of God. We can contemplate it. So when we sit over here, resting in this covenant, the veil is removed. And more and more, he reveals his heart to us, of course, through his word, through worship, through the teaching in the church, etc. But through your quiet times. And don't try to understand. Just receive. And God's revealing his father heart, his glory to us. He said, look, you're my child. I've redeemed you. I've loved you even before the foundation of the world. Me, me. Me, Lord, I'm no good. No, he says, no, I made you good. You were no good, I know that. It's a fact, I mean, let's face it, right? Let's face it, we were no good. But he, he took us. We don't want to argue with that. I'm so glad he took us. I'm so glad. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus as yet, give it today at the end of the service. Say, Lord, look. I turn myself to you. I turn. I have faith in this covenant. I have faith that Jesus died on the cross for me. I have faith. Lord, God says, done. I accept you as my son, daughter. You can now begin this beautiful life of transformation by faith. By faith. You'll see more. This transformation starts as you contemplate the Lord's glory. So transformation begins and ends with resting in God. I'm taking now Psalm 23, as well as 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 to 14. There we go. So in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 to 14, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name and have known the Father. You're a child of God. Your sins have been forgiven and you got the spirit of sonship. And you can say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You're resting. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Oh God, you refresh my soul. You guide me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And you know what the Lord is? He delights in you. He loves you. He loves you and me. So yeah, I'm your shepherd. I'm your shepherd. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to lead you. You see, your prayer life must begin with resting with God. That's how you begin. Don't wind yourself up. Just rest in God. You know, I teach a lot in the villages, and I, I tell them, how do you make an omelet? So they tell me, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, put this, that. I say, no, the first thing is, you've got to break the egg. I mean, if you don't break the egg, you can't make an omelet. You know, you can't enter the presence of God unless you start resting in Him. You understand? No use beating yourself and trying to whip up your emotions, forget it. First, break the egg. First, sit quietly before God. Let him tell you how much he loves you. Just rest in his presence. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to put my trust in him. I'm going to put my trust in that covenant. So, you know, when you sit before God, three things I want to tell you that can happen. First, God favors you, God transforms you, and God empowers you by his grace. Grace means you don't deserve it, but he does it. Next slide. Yeah. Transformation occurs due to grace as you rest in God but you must surrender total remember you're not under the old covenant 
old covenant, you've got to work for it. In the new covenant, you just have faith in his grace. So when you sit down here before him, God says, I favor you. I favor you because I love you the same amount as I love Jesus, my own son. That's given in John 17, 23. That's what God says. Jesus says the same thing. You, Father, have loved them even as you have loved me. So, God says, look, I love you. I favor you. There's nothing that you earned. Just receive my love. I love you. Just, just sit down quietly and receive his love. Receive his love. But then God also transforms you by his grace. Because, you know, as you contemplate the Lord's glory, you are transformed. That's what we, we talked about in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He transforms you. He transforms you to be like Jesus. He transforms you. How he does is by his grace. Is by his grace. You know, grace transforms us. Well, you know, let me tell you something about this. Grace doesn't tell us how far we can go and yet be accepted by God. Okay? He accepts me. So grace doesn't give you how far you can go and yet be accepted by God. That's true, but it won't help you. Grace doesn't tell us how far we can go and yet, God, you still love me? That's true, but it won't help you. Because if you want transformation, this is what God says to you. His grace is like this. God loves me so much and he has set me free so much, I just want to use it. Who I am, what I am to love God. I just want to use his grace to love him more. So grace wants me, enables me to love God more. Because you know, when somebody really loves you, deep down in your heart and you're convinced of it, you want to love him back. And grace is like that. He says, I loved you first. So we love because he loved us first. And grace puts that into our heart. Look, I love you. I love you. I love you. And it breaks our heart and says, oh God, I want to love you too. I want to love you too. Grace transforms us that way. And we say, oh God, I want to love you too. I mean, look at the hymns that we have sung this morning. You know, Grace transforms us as we spend time with God. I'm not under the law, but I'm under love. I'm in love with the Lord, and I want to use my life to honor him. That's grace in my heart. That's really taking that grace. It's not how far can I go, and yet you love me. That's childishness. Children behave something that way. But as you grow in maturity, it's not as far as you can go. You say, God, I'm broken by your love. I'm broken. And I want to honor you. You know, what hurts Christians a lot is a part message of grace. The only thing, the good news of grace is how far can I go? And yet I'm accepted. But they miss out the most important part of grace. That's true. What, what they said is true, by the way. I'm not going to take one simple, one small comma out of it. Even if you are strayed very far, God says, I still love you. I still love you. If you are a prodigal son, daughter, I still love you. I mean, he, he won't take anything away from his love. You're still loved. When you are far away from God, so I still love you. But I want you to enjoy me. I want to make you like me. That's what I want to do for you. Because that will really satisfy you. That's really going to transform you. That's, you're really going to be happy with that product. That won't make you happy. It won't make you happy. 
You know, the prodigal son, he, never, he was never happy far away. He was happy when he came back. So I'm not saying that the gospel is like, you know, that grace is not available to you far away. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying grace is something which brings you back and gets you closer to God so that you're transformed and that you're really happy. That you're really happy. When a person understands grace, I tell you one thing, he wants to spend time with this transformation. You know, the reading of the Bible does not become a chore. The reading of the Bible, spending time becomes a joy because you're being transformed. You're being transformed. And every day you say, oh God, I, I want to spend time with you. I want to spend time with you, man. I'm looking forward to this foolish fellow becoming a bit wiser. Becoming like Jesus. So, grace transforms you, also empowers you. Empowers you to be all that God designed you to be. All right? He empowers you. That's tremendous. That's what Paul said. I became a servant, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 to 8. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace, given me through the working of his power. Although I'm the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Oh, man. He says, I'm the least. But it is God's grace to be what I am. God gave me this grace. He empowered me. He empowered me. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what Paul says. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Notice something about this verse. Grace comes first, and then you cooperate with the grace and work hard to make use of the grace that God gave me. For example, well, we have got a wonderful people singing over here. Tremendous. What a voice. That's the grace of God. Some of us can't sing. Amen. You know that. But this person who was leading in worship and the others, of course, they had a good voice. That was a gift of God. That was the grace of God. But they got to spend time in practice. I mean, that's hard work, isn't it? They got to use that grace to work hard. I mean, and improve themselves to learn all the chords, to learn combination. I mean, they, for the Christian life, it is first 100% grace but it must be accompanied by 100% hard work, okay? That's what Paul says. By the grace I am, grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, he says, I worked harder than all of them. Now, I want to ask you a question. Every one of us has grace. If you're a believer, you have grace. You have grace to sit before God. God gives you grace to transform yourself, to transform, it, to transform you. But God grace gives you grace to empower you. And so every one of us who has been called to this table has an assignment. Every one of us. No exception. If you have an assignment, what are you doing about it? Because there's grace to empower you. What are you doing about it? Now, you've got to couple that grace by faith. Right? Otherwise, grace does not work. That's how you are saved to begin off with. By grace, we have been saved through faith. You've got to put your faith, trust, confidence in that grace of God, that God has called you for something. And say, okay, God, you can count on me. I'm going to work. I'm going to put my life behind that grace by faith. Then you see that God power 
is there for you and for me. We are a changed people. Now, you know, sitting for me has become a revelation. There's a great exchange that takes place when I sit before God. And this great exchange is this. First, I must surrender my life, my thinking, everything to him. My fears, my anxieties, everything, my ambitions, my desires, everything. My fears, my fears. We've got a lot of fears. Anxieties, oh man. Anxieties. We're living in an anxious world. But I've got to focus on Jesus because Jesus focuses on me. You know, he does, and, you know, I, it's amazing. He's totally focused on me. He's God. So he can focus on each one of us individually. So he doesn't have to double task, multitask, like what we do sometimes. We multitask. We do this, we do that, we do this at the same time. And we also say, Jesus, I'm spending time with you, huh? but listen, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. We multitask. But he doesn't multitask with us. He looks at us. He's focused on us. He loves us to bits. He wants to empower us. He wants to transform us. That's what he wants to do. So there is a great exchange taking place. And this great exchange is, I surrender my life to you. Now, this surrender is not something I can say I'm a master of. But I'm learning from others as well. But every day, I have to surrender. Every day when I sit over here, I surrender to Jesus. Because I want to receive his grace by faith to transform me. As long as I'm doing my own monkey tricks, it won't work. It just doesn't work. I, in my mind, I try to manipulate. You know, I, I will do this, and I will say that. I will do this, I will do that. It doesn't work. Because I haven't surrendered everything to him. Now, sit down here, I surrender to him. And every morning, of course, it takes me a long time to surrender, by the way. It takes me a long time to surrender. Because my head is full of scheming. I scheme a lot. Da, 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 da. Okay. But it takes me time to quieten my heart and say, I surrender all to you. Completely. You know what Jesus says? Listen. I sang that song first before you sang it. He sang it on the cross. I surrender all to you. And he calls us to surrender to him. Because when he surrender, his grace starts flowing into our lives. There is this great exchange. You know, discipleship is a process from moving from unbelief to belief in absolutely every area of your life. You say, listen, of course I know that. Yeah, but when you're sitting before God, if you know there is unrest in your heart, you haven't surrendered. If there is unrest concerning your family, you haven't surrendered. If there is unrest concerning your job, you haven't surrendered. And so you have to surrender to him, and then you will find his grace working in that area of your life. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. And discipleship is a process of surrendering. It's discipleship is a process of believing, moving from unbelief, because unbelief tells me I've got to do something, I've got to work, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do that thing. Moving from unbelief to belief in every area of your life. That's discipleship. I didn't invent this. I got it from someone else. But anyway, it works with me. Now, sitting down over there, I mean, I'm a master of sitting. I get abundant grace that um, enables me to reign in life. Wow! I want to reign in life. For if by the trespasses of one man, that reign through that one man, how much more will we who receive God's abundant provision of grace. Every blessing. Abundant provision of grace. And the gift of righteousness will reign in life. 
through that one man, Jesus Christ. Whoa, I want to reign in life. That's, that's something that blows my mind off. Now, where do you get the sources of grace? Of course, it's through the Word of God, through prayer, through worship, etc. But God's Word to us does not bring condemnation. His lips were anointed with grace in Psalm 45. Temple guards came to arrest him, and they couldn't arrest him. They said, no one spoke like him. See, God's word is full of grace. He says, my words are spirit and they are life. And as you spend time with God's word, understanding will come as you turn to him in faith. Partaking of this Lord's Supper, which I'm just demonstrating, but you've got to do it worthily. So when, you're, when the pastor is, you know, having the Lord's Supper, breaking of bread, don't be lazy in your mind. Some, many of us, you know, we have this holy look. But our minds are all around the place. God is not impressed with your holy look. But engage your mind, engage your heart. Say, God, I want to do business with you. I want to do business with you through the Lord's Supper. Because I want every blessing that comes through this supper. Through this. I want every blessing, Lord. I want healing. I want everything from you. Everything. I'm greedy for everything. That's all right. That's okay. But engage your heart during the Lord's Supper. And he says, do it worthily, because if somebody else, you've got something against somebody else, drop it. Be gone. That's, that's peanuts. I'm out. I'm out. I'm not in that. I want you, Lord, on your terms. I want every blessing. Every blessing. I'm not going to be cheated. I'm not going to be cheated. Engage your heart with the Lord's Supper. Engage your heart. If you're truly after the Lord, you will honor those who are after God's heart. You see, I want to throw my life behind this person. This person is in love with God. I'm going to throw my life behind him. And he says, if you honor his servants, what that servant gets, you will get. That's what he said. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 to 42, he says, you will receive a prophet's honor if you honor a prophet. So whatever, if you see a man of God, a woman of God, throw your lot behind them because you say, look, this person is following God. I want something from this person. God says, I'll give you that because you're after my heart. And the last thing is, if you want grace, be an encourager of others. You know, in the church, what I see often is that we look at others, what they are not. Oh, you know this guy? Yeah, he's okay. But, you know, ah, I don't want to say anything. See, you're looking at that person, what he is not. Not celebrating what God has done in his life. And so when you meet another Christian, celebrate what God is doing in his life. Be an encourager. Because when you are an encourager, you're building up others up. He says, do not let any word escape from your mouth except what is good for building others up. That's given in Ephesians 4, 29. All right? Be an encourager everywhere because you're being an agent of grace. And God, as you sow, you will reap. So, those are sources of grace. But we want to go ahead. You know, we, we started by being children. But God said, I want you to be an overcomer. Because this is a life of faith from beginning to the end. So, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 13 to 14, yeah, yeah there we are. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God lives in you. And you have overcome the evil one. You are not a child anymore. God says, look, I, you have spent time with God. You have rested with God. You have eaten his words, grown in his words. God says, good. Now you are going to be an overcomer. All right? 
And how do you become an overcomer? Through trials and temptations, right? So there we see in Psalm 23, verse 4 and 5, even though I walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of that same thing, the darkest valley, I will fear four things. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. There we are. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Enemies are all around there. They can see me, I can see them. They can hear me, I can hear them. But they can't touch me because I'm with him. All right? Forget it. Forget them. And if people talk against me, whatever, those words, I should let it drop in front of my Lord Jesus because he prepares this table before me in the presence of my enemies. Right? In the presence of my enemies. And then he says, listen, I want to tell you, I will anoint your head with oil. I will honor you. And your cup overflows. I will provide for you. Abundant provision. Two things. You can see, this covenant is over there. So, you know, that's how you become an overcomer. Don't listen to the enemy. You know, Jesus is on the throne. And the devil is what? Defeated. Jesus is on the throne. And the devil is defeated. So don't pay attention. I mean, the enemy voices will, can come through members of the church, can come through members of the family, can come through your neighbors, can come through so many things. It doesn't matter. But you're sitting before Jesus. You're sitting before Jesus. Cast all your anxieties upon him, for he cares for you. You know, there, are, there is another thing which I found out. There are certain things I don't understand why it happens to me. After I've done everything nice, yet I'm in trouble. And I say, Lord, why am I in trouble? What wrong have I done? I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. And yet I'm in trouble. And it has happened to people. And it has happened to me. But... I have to submit even my understanding. In Psalm 131, I'm just going to read it out to you. My heart is not proud, O oh God. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled, my, stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forever. You see, I can't understand why I'm going through problems. I can't understand so many things. But I say, Lord, I'm going to drop because I'm going to submit my understanding to you because the peace that surpasses my understanding, I get it from him, surpasses my understanding. I want that peace. So I trust him wholeheartedly. I have faith in him. I'm living by faith. I said, God, if you drop me, I'm dropped. But you're not going to drop me. I'm going to trust you. I don't understand so many things. Then I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to trust you. Like a wee child with its mother. Doesn't understand why all these people are screaming and shouting, but mommy is there. That's what this is. Right. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, they triumphed over him. That means they overcame him, the Satan, by three things. By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of God, which you all know, word of the testimony means I am a child of God. I am redeemed. That's the word of your testimony. And the third thing is, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. You know, when the enemies come and tell me, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, that's going to happen, that's going to happen. Enemy voices, he wants to put fear in me. You know what I answer them? So what? So what? So what means? Listen, it makes no difference to me. I have given my life to Christ. Even to death, I, tr I trust him. If I'm prepared to die for Christ, what you're saying that will happen to me means nothing. So I say, so what? In Hindi, we say, to kya? 
देन आई शॉर्ट इन डेट तो दिस इज हैपन तो यू डिफीट इम बिकॉज ऑफ दिस कॉवेनेंट दिस कॉवेनेंट इज देर तो दिस इज हैपन यू सी आई इज द पीस दैट पास इज अंडरस्टैंडिंग एवरी मॉर्निंग इज माई appointment with god every morning i am victorious every morning i am an overcomer every morning that's a life of faith transformation finally will make you more than conquerors i write to your fathers because you know him who is from the beginning i write to your fathers you see you have become a father you're not a young man anymore you're going up you were a child you became a young man an overcomer but now you're sitting with him who is from the beginning you know he is faithful from the beginning you know that he is faithful god and you're sitting with him and so you can say surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever you are more than a conqueror Romans 8:37 No in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us God wants you to be more than conquerors Second thing I believed therefore I have spoken since we have the same spirit of faith we also believe therefore we speak we have to confess it because we believe we believe in our hearts that he will not forsake me we believe in our hearts that he has made a covenant with us we believe it Therefore I will say surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I tell you one thing Jesus is amazed at your faith because he sees the battle that you are going through and he's amazed at your faith. Numbers 23 verse 21 when Balaam the evil prophet wanted to curse when Balaam the evil prophet wanted to curse Israel he saw Israel and he said no misfortune is seen in Jacob no misery observed in Israel the lord their god is with them the shout of the king is amongst them the shout of the king he said i can't curse them he was the most evil person he said i can't curse them the shout of the king is amongst them the shout of the king is inside the church the shout of the king the glorious king the god of all the mighty king the shout of the king is inside the church i'm not going to be afraid of anything the shout of the king is amongst us finally finally i'm going to conclude just going to wrap it up please know that our discipleship is a process therefore every day we move from resting to overcoming to being more than conquerors every day in our daily prayer time in our one to one with god we begin with resting and as we pray to him we will get all these things coming up we overcome and as we overcome we get up and say you are more than conquerors the shout of the king is with me amen amen god bless you huh god bless you all i'm going to pray for you huh? praise the lord praise god hallelujah the lord is good my friends oh the shout of the king i want to see the king i want to see him oh god you're so beautiful all these songs that we sang to you lord you're more beautiful than that that our hearts were so warmed up when we saw the king arise in our worship the king arise lord we want you to arise in our daily life all the time lord you want you to be the focus oh god lord jesus you are so beautiful you are so beautiful lord jesus and everybody any one over your lord who is having some problems yeah i know that you're able to meet with that person i give you thanks lord i praise you people also having problems with 
habitual sin, Lord. You're able to break it. And we break it in Jesus' name because our Jesus is a mighty king. People who are having problems with their bodies and sufferings, oh, they're, you're bring healing to them even now because you're the mighty king. You're the beautiful Jesus. You're the mighty king. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord God. People who are struggling in their faith. Oh, God, you're going to raise them up because you delight in them. You delight in each one of us, Lord. Oh, the shout of the king is amongst us. I praise you, Jesus. May your name be glorified, Lord, in your body. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.